changed everything <laughs> and the one thing I didn't change is the title on this video is I I changed it in the last five minutes so um Javier hello Javier nice to see you yes I'm doing good thank you um yeah kind of a slow lazy day for me today um Lots of yawning. <laughs> if I yawn in this video, uh, please excuse me. <laughs> right? Um, all right, who's got a question? So what I did this week was I posted the video immediately after we finished last time. That way, I, just as an experiment, so that way it would have, it would notify people for a whole week. Oh, my hair. I am uh, officially, right after this, I'm going to get my hair cut. No more waiting. <laughs> anyway, it was just an experiment. I wanted to see if, if having it up for a whole week in advance, because you can schedule it for a lot longer than just like hours in advance. And um, yeah, so I tried it this week, thinking maybe more people would get signed on, but it didn't actually work that way. So yeah, I'm not sure what, I might still keep doing that because that's kind of nice, right? So I don't have to put a lot of effort, a lot of work into getting this chat set up in the days before. So, um, yeah, it's kind of nice to get it set up immediately afterwards. Anyway, anybody got any questions today? Or comments? Or considerations? Yeah, I guess it's a slow day today. <laughs> Javier says, I realize that my main goal in trumpet playing is to be able to play what I sing in my head, like scatting. What steps would you recommend to achieve that? Well, let's break it down, right? So, um, one of my favorite things to do First of all, I would say this, do lots of scat singing. Do lots and lots and lots and lots of it. Do it with tracks, do it without tracks. Um, and, and, and take it as seriously as you would playing the horn because actually you're right. The whole point of playing jazz is, is to hear I, I'm, I'm not exactly comfortable with your exact wording, but it's the same thing as what I, what, how I would say it. It's just I would say it differently. Because I do believe that beneath that. So I think where, what, where I have a problem is when you say my main goal. Um, my main goal is to express myself. How I express myself in jazz has to do with the lines that I choose to play. So you see how I'm saying that's very similar to what you're saying, but I like to emphasize the expressions aspect of it. Um, 
Now, the lines that you're singing, every once in a while, you should stop and say, hey, what I just sang right now, that was really, really nice. Let me sing it again. Sing that same phrase 50 times. And I can tell you over that course of 50 times, it's going to change slightly. And it's going to change to something that you even like more. Okay, don't be afraid to, to, to let it morph just a little bit through that 50 times. Because by doing it 50 times, you're going to make it more natural. It's going to become more um, of an expression of, of your personality, right? Then get your paper out and your pencil and write down what you're singing. That can be a little difficult at times because where you're singing is probably not in a right, uh, not in a favorable key. So that's why when I write it down, I like to make sure that what I'm writing is relative, not the exact notes. So, and I always keep the paper. I always keep paper for this handy. I don't know if I've shown you this stuff. So, I'll, I'll get the pencil out, and I don't have a pencil right here. I don't know where my pencils went. Um, I'll separate this so I know that it's not something different. And then I'll, I'll write down relatively what I think it is. If it's, if it's in the key of B, I'm putting it in the key of C. If it's in the key of D flat, I might put it in C or D. Um, I, I want it to be relative. So if I'm hearing bo dee bo doo bee doo ba dee ba da, right? Um, so I'm gonna do that 50 times. Do dee bo doo bee doo ba dee ba da, bo dee bo doo bee doo ba dee ba da. So now da da da, I'm hearing C B flat A. Do dee bo doo bee doo ba dee ba dee ba da, bo doo bo do dee bo bo dee doo ba dee. So I'm thinking maybe F G C B flat A, right? So I'm gonna start putting those notes down and then you ask should I practice that in every key so here's how I do every key I don't like the whole every key thing and and I have found finally a way to phrase it when I say I don't like it when I say that I think I give the wrong impression because I do every key I want my students to do every key. So what am I saying? Why am I saying that I don't like it? I don't like it because we get we get the impression that that's the end of it. <laughs> when in reality, that's the beginning of it. That's how I introduce myself to a new phrase. That's how I introduce, my students should introduce themselves to a new phrase. That's just the first step. But yes, uh, short answer to your question. Should you practice the phrase in every key? Yes, sir, you should practice it in every key. Practice it in every key. Um, but that is just the first step. The next thing we want to do is break down the motifs that are in the phrase. Sometimes there's no, hello, Raima, nice to see you. Um, Sometimes the motifs are not worth breaking down that way, so that's fine. So, like for for example, the ones that I just sang, booty boo boo that would not be worth breaking down because it's got basically everything in there is included. By the way, how do I figure out what should not be broken down? If it's in the tonalization studies, then it's not then we're already doing that. Why would we break it down to that? So if I have a lick that I'm hearing in my head that goes. Something like that. Well, basically those motifs are already in the tonalization studies. I'm not going to break that down. I'm not going to break that down. But if I'm singing something that has a, a little bit more character to it, um, so I might do that. So I just, let me see. So 
So uh, that one might be a little, have a little bit more character. I don't know. So uh, it's kind of hard to just like fake, pretend I'm actually doing that because the way it really happens is that I'll be scatting for like 15 minutes and something will pop out that strikes me as something that really, really resonates with me, something that really sounds like that should really be part of how I play. Javier says, first thing I did in my life was singing in school because I was in the choir, right? And then I played the flute. All right, I didn't know that. I play other instruments during my life, but I guess me and everybody are fundamentally singers. You know, there's a great book that I read. Let me grab it real quick. There are bad reviews about this book online. I think they're stupid. The reviews that I've read that criticize this book um, are not intelligent reviews. They're, they're actually, anyway, this is an orchestration book by William Russo. Bill Russo, Bill Russo, I think he's most popular, most famous for being trombone player in the Stan Kenton Orchestra. And in this book, he talks about two kinds of, well, two kinds of melody. Um, one, I, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what he calls it. If I were to paraphrase, not using his exact words, I would say that, he, that one is called vocal mel melody. And the other one is called instrumental melody. Let's see what he says. 79. And he basically makes the 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 he he, he's, he makes a statement about how like if you're a piano player, something can sound melodic, even though if we were to sing that same thing, there's nothing melodic about it. So there is such a thing as, so I'm not seeing it immediately, but yes, this is the book I got that out of. So he calls, I don't see the, the words he he's using. Yeah, this book breaks down the essence of what music is. And I think the people who are, complain about that book, I think what they're complaining about is they wanted some sort of quick, tell me how to write music. Hello, Gabriel, nice to see you. Tell me how to write music. And instead of writing a book that just simply tells you how to write music, what he wrote was a book that takes a deep dive into what music really is. And I think for a lot of people, that's just way too, that's like overkill. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he's also got like a little notebook like a, a little book like this with, with like 60 pages in it that gives you the bare bones of how to write a chart. Um, this deep dive, uh, you know, I think it's one of the best books about music. What is music? What is uh, not, not so much how to write, but what to write, right? What to... Oh, this, this, uh, all I can say is that this is a hugely influential book in my personal uh, composition. Now, why are we talking about that is because you brought up this connection between us being singers, fundamentally singers, and that's, there's a, a lot of truth to that. But I do believe there, there are some aspects of what we do as trumpet players 
that fall in the category of what he, and, and once again, these are my words, I don't remember how he worded it, what he calls um, instrumental melody. Now, once again, my words, I don't remember his exact wording. But there is a different kind of melodic playing that we can do that singers cannot do. And we, so we're, we've, as trumpet players, in our improvisation, and why would I reference a book on composition in the context of improvisation? It's because comp, uh, improvisation is spontaneous composition. The better you get at composing, the better you get at improvisation. And the better you are at improvisation, the better you're going to get at composing. The two of them are um, interconnected. I like to think of composing as slow motion improvisation. So, um, so yes, we can we can gain a lot of insight about the improvisation process by using by reading books about composition and learning about composition. Um, and that's, that's how I feel about it. So not everything that we play is now, okay, let me finish that thought before I, you know, I'm, I'm going through this phase right now and I'm doing it like three times in a row here where I'm trying to stop, interrupt myself when I'm speaking. I'll be in the middle of a sentence. I'll hear another sentence in my head and I'll start saying that sentence when I haven't finished the other one yet. So, um, number one, we are not required. Not everything that comes out of our horn is required to be vocal in nature. All right? That's, that's not an absolute necessi necessity. There are things we can do on the trumpet, like Freddie Hubbard, right? <laughs> right? When he did all that stuff, I'm not warmed up, but that's stuff that, that can be musical and, and, and uh, with good phrasing and stuff like that, but it's not vocal phrasing, right? So, um, but here's number two, is that some of the most amazing jazz trumpet players are the ones that don't do any of that other stuff. They only do stuff that, that they hear in their heads, right? They only do the vocal style melody. Those are some amazing, amazing, amazing players. Okay, so I'm not saying you have to play that way, but there are but there are benefits to playing that way and only playing that way. There are some benefits to that. Okay, that's my stance on that. Javier says those are some cool concepts you're sharing, Eddie. Well, thank you. I enjoy talking about all of this stuff. You know, the the official the official purpose of these Q and A's is to talk about trumpet and then music in general. So we could talk jazz, we can talk classical, we can specifically trumpet. We can talk we can talk about different kinds of trumpet because you know I I do. And I guess we wouldn't be limited just because I couldn't play something, but the truth is I can play just about everything that trumpet plays. So if people are interested in talking about Tejano music, we can talk about Tejano music and how trumpet players in Tejano music have to play, or salsa, or uh, cumbias. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I've told you guys I love cumbias. You know... They just started at at the the grocery store where I where I shop. They just started 
um, putting more salsa on. And there's times when they'll put like um, Colombian cumbias on. Like, um, what's the guy's name? I want to say Fito Olivares, but that's, I think that's the guy that lives here in Houston. Yeah, Fito Olivares is the guy that is here. What's the guy, the guy that does, and I say Colombian cumbias, I'm always getting that wrong. I think this guy is actually Venezuelan. I love this guy's cumbias. I can't remember what his name is, though. I love it. I love all cumbias, even Tejano cumbias, um, the Mexican cumbias. I love all of it. It's such a, uh, uh, a happy style of music. You can't have a cumbia on. Anyway, so they play at the grocery store. They play cumbias every once in a while. And I just want to, like, um, dance through the aisles. Gabriel says, Eddie, I have a friend who's a tenor at opera. He told me he locks the abdominal muscles and fills lungs as much as he can. Do you think this can be applied to trumpet too? Of course it can be. I have my own different way of, of doing breathing. So he locks the abdominal muscles and then fill and fill, and he fills the lungs as much as he can. That sounds almost like what I do. One of these days I will make a video about how I breathe because it's not. I've had two students this week that I that we talked about this. But yes, I think that's probably real close to what I do. Javier says September 18th in Chile is like the 4th of July to you, and they play a lot of cumbias, not because is our national dance, it's because it's because they are fun and people get drunk and dance to it. That's right. Hello, Cardo, nice to see you. Yeah, I love cumbias. Maybe the guy's name is Lopez. Pastor Lopez, that's his name, Pastor. Pastor Lopez. I've played so many of his. Let me look him up. I used to play a lot of this stuff. A lot of his songs I used to play in the 90s. I mean, a lot. I used to play with a, a, a band that everybody in the band was Colombian. Oh, so that, I, I looked him up. He's Venezuelan. But yeah, this, this guy... We used to play a whole bunch of, of Pastor Lopez, a whole bunch, and I love it. Raimo says, I love cumbias too. All right. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a cumbia party one day. I'll have my friend Luis Juarez come out, and we'll, we'll talk cumbias for a whole day. Gabriel asks, is, is posture while playing on the stage very important for a jazz trumpet player? Um, you know what I tell my students, and I tell them this stylistically, and I'm going to say it now as a, as, a, as a way to sort of answer your question. 
Jazz started off as a very rebellious style of music. Now, I'm not, this is not a history lesson. This is a philosophy lesson. Don't go telling people that I gave you a history lesson because I'm likely to get that wrong. Okay? So I'm speaking in generalities here. Jazz is started off and it has its roots in, in uh, what's that? Irreverence, disrespect. Um, what I was told, and I'm not 100% sure this is true anymore because I've been told a lot of stuff that's not true, but I love it. I love to tell this story because it helps give you an idea of what jazz is. Jazz, before it came, became a, the name of a, a, a music, jazz used to be the equivalent of our F word. So if you can imagine 100 years ago, 120 years ago, when people were still really stiff, really proper, really prim, calling a style of music the F word. That was, you, if you if you read the the the, the articles, the, the newspaper articles back then, they actually considered jazz the devil's music, and a big 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 part of that is just because you live in a society back then that that being rebellious was not okay. Doing things your own way was not okay. So, for example, when we when 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 they said let's jazz it up, what they meant was the equivalent of let's f it up. Okay, so that's the roots that jazz comes from, and so what I like to tell my students so they can get a proper philosophical understanding of the style. And once again, I'm going to stress that I'm speaking philosophically. Some of this might not be true. But to help the students get a philosophical understanding of the style, I tell them that just about everything about classical music, everything that we consider right about classical music, if you flip it upside down, that's how you play jazz. Okay? So, for example, in classical music, you want every note to sound, have the same tone quality. In classical music, you want the beginning of the note and the end of the note and everything in between to have the same tone quality. That is the mark of a great classical musician. And that's one of the reasons why people... I don't know if I've told you the story yet, but a, a famous trumpet player once told me that my classical music is not cl uh, true classical music. He said it's quasi-classical. Um, I think he meant it, meant it as a criticism. I took it as a compliment. <laughs> right? <laughs> I took it as a compliment because it meant that I'm doing my own thing in my classical writing. Um, right? So, but, um, I think that's one of the things that he heard in my playing is that I don't have that skill that those great, great, great trumpet players have, the classical guys have, to make it so, the, the tone is so homogenous, so homogenous throughout. Now, if you look at, at, um, jazz, we don't want that. That's what makes the classical guys sound terrible when they're playing jazz. Is they've got that same hom homogenous tone throughout everything. It sounds sterile compared to what we do when we're playing. Right? So, and that's just one example. That's just one example. 
in, in classical, you don't want just one note to pop out out of nowhere. Right? You don't want stuff like that. But in jazz, you want these notes to pop out because that's what gives it the flavor. And there's a whole bunch of things we can talk about in that context. So, so jazz really is an irreverent music when you compare it to classical music. I'm not saying that we're supposed to be irreverent, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm just telling, this is how I help people get a, 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 a visualization of, of how jazz works, right? So when we compare a jazz player to a classical player, uh, in classical player, uh, in classical music, you want to be sitting up straight. You want that perfect posture and all that. In jazz, in jazz, you play the way that's comfortable for you. And it doesn't matter what the people see. So, yeah. So, so for example, I'll tell you what, just, to, just as, as an example of what I'm talking about. Um, well, I won't tell that story. The last, well, no, I won't tell it. Okay. So anyway, I like to play with my arms tucked here. I've been criticized for that for many, many, many years. But that's how I play. That's how I'm comfortable. And when I'm playing jazz, I'll do that. If I'm playing classical, I might put my, my shoulders out, my elbows out. Because I know that people are watching and that's just not okay. I hope that makes sense. So, yes, Pat, uh, I'm going to say, in, in, a, in a direct answer to your question, I'm going to say that posture is important, but not in the same sense as it is for classical. And in jazz, your posture has to be your posture. Play the way that's comfortable for you. Because that posture is part of what makes you sound the way you do. Javier says that Pasta Lopez guy ha had some cool set of rings. <laughs> I haven't, let me see, the, I haven't seen pictures. You know, it's not like I ever met him. Oh, look at those rings. You know, that looks like for fighting. You know, that almost looks like for fighting. I love his music. Fito Olivares, for that matter, is also a great cumbia player. It's just an entirely different kind of cumbia. Um, I, I'm, I have difficulty pronouncing the name of his album that I have. Um, basically, the, the, the Spanish equivalent of zoological. And um, so he has a bunch of songs about animals. There's, you probably heard this one. It starts off. The guy says, sapo, sap, sap, sapo, right? La cumbia supita, la cumbia terora. I don't know all the words, but um, <laughs> I, so that's the kind of stuff that guy writes. Um, Fito Olivares is his name. But it's more like a, a Mexican cumbia. Cardo says, hello, Eddie. After many years playing on bigger mouthpieces, I found out recently that I can play easily on a Bach one and a half C. Do you think this is an okay mouthpiece? What is your opinion on that size? I, I think that if you can play on a one and a half C, then a uh, 10 and a half C, then you should play on a 10 and a half C. There's no need to go big. Um, the only reason I go big is because of my teeth. And for that matter, so I, I heard this philosophy a long time ago, and I like it. Go with the smallest mouthpiece you can play comfortably. 
That sounds like a good rule of thumb to me. Go with the smallest mouthpiece that you can play comfortably. Because, you know, the, the, you sacrifice, there, there's so much that you sacrifice when you go to the bigger sizes. And in fact, I'm, we, just, we just talked about why I'm not a whole full-fledged classical player, even though I spend so much time practicing classic, classical stuff, writing classical music. Um, but I think part of the reason I have this thing where it's hard to control and, and get exactly that right sound from one note to the next is because my mouthpieces are huge. And the reason they're huge is because I have three corners that I have to get the rim around. If I can't get the rim around those three corners, I will bleed, <laughs> okay? And I don't like to bleed while I'm playing. I don't have a problem with bleeding, but not when I'm playing, <laughs> right? So, um, so yeah. So yes, I, I, to me, Go with the smallest size that you can. I'm just one of those ones that can't. Gabriel says, in Miles' bi uh, biography, he says that he, Bird, and Diz used, usually played in small clubs where the audience was very expensed. As the players stepped onto the stage and assumed inappropriate postures, he was literally kicked before starting to play a note. Wow. Can that be possible? Yes, that can be possible. Yes, that's possible. Um, you know, the, the, the traditions have changed a little bit, right? The guys, back in those days, the older guys were very, and in a good way, right? In a very good way, the older guys were, they, they, they would tell you, hey, you're doing that wrong, right? They'll, they'll say, hey, that, that you did right there. Now, today, we don't have the courage to do that. And I put myself in that category, too. Um, me, personally, and, and I don't know why I feel this way. But if you're a screw up on the gig, that's your problem, not mine. And I don't know where I get that from. I don't know why I feel that way. Um, but I'm not one of those that feels like I have to take you under my ring, wing if you're going to be blatantly. Uh, I'd like to believe that it's the fault of the society. That So, see, I learned my lesson that I can't change society myself. And, if, and, and in fact, you know what? Let me, let me use for you as an example my son. So you can get a dynamic of what I'm talking about here. My son, my current wife is not my first wife, and my son is from the previous marriage. Okay? If you have somebody who's speaking into your life and then another person who's also speaking into your life, one says, go ahead, eat the ice cream. And the other one says, you should probably not eat the ice cream because that's going to make you fat. That's going to make you sick. Eat healthy stuff instead. Well, it's human nature to go to the one that says, eat the ice cream. Do the stuff that you want to do, right? It's human nature to go with that. And I see this in our society today. I would be glad to take trumpet players under my wing. But I would be the only one doing it. I would be the only one saying, hey, this that you just did, hey, that's just not cool. Don't do that again. I what kind of reputation would I have in Houston if I was like that? 
So I, 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 would, I would like to blame, I would like to blame society, right? Because if I'm the only one that's, that's playing that role, and, and yes, so that's why I was saying, Gabriel, earlier, when we were talking about posture, that's why I'm saying that I'm speaking philosophically, not historically. I don't know the history so well. But when we're talking about jazz, that culture there, that's gone. I hope, I hope I'm making that clear. That culture there where people actually cared enough about the younger players to kick them. That's gone. We don't have that anymore. And you would be a fool to be the only one doing it because you'd ne probably never get hired again. That's how I see it. And it's, it's just a sign of the society we live in right now. I'll tell you what, I have no problem being that way if I'm the one that's the leader on the gig. Um, but I wouldn't be that way about the posture. I think I would have to start off with something else. So like, for example, posture, let me see. If I had a, if I had a band and the guys were, um, I don't know, it would be real hard for me to decide where I'm going to draw the posture line. I can't imagine. But I'm sure there's, you know, anyway. Hard to answer that question, right? Cardo says, thank you, Eddie. You're welcome. The truth is I ha that I have more endurance and an easier register with the ten, ten and a half seats. That, well, that's for a reason. The farther out, the bigger the mouthpiece is, the more muscle you have to engage. The smaller the mouthpiece is, the less muscle you have to engage. Okay? So the smaller mouthpiece does more of the work for you. Gabriel says, it seems to me to too much orthodox. Yep. So today, you know, people just do what they do. You know, when you read all those histories, um, you really see a whole different picture from the communities we live in today. People actually truly cared about each other. I don't believe when we when we don't when we don't tell the guy off of who's doing it wrong if, when we don't do that that's because we don't care about them and somehow in our society today that got flipped around and now you're the enemy if you have the guts to tell somebody they did it wrong you have now become the bad guy and that's why i brought up the the whole um, divorce thing, right? Is because I, so I never changed. I was always the one that told my son the stuff he needed to hear. And I'm not going to get into details because I, I, to this day, I still have not badmouthed my ex wife. And I won't start now. Okay. This is not badmouthing my ex wife. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not insulting her or anything, but but this problem with my son was continual. I would tell him the right thing to do. I would I would admonish him if he needed admonishment. But he had another life. And I felt like I was always the bad guy. I was always the bad guy. Always, always, always. Because that's how this world we live in sees people who care enough to straighten you out. That's how this world sees it. And I sound like I'm getting angry. <laughs> I'm a stoic person. I'm not angry. <laughs> I don't get angry. 
if I do get angry, I make myself calm down. So yes, I think I think those were better times. I think it's better to tell people, hey, you screwed up. But what I'm sort of saying is I can't be, I can't put my family's livelihood on the on at risk by being the person that, that you know, I actually believe. I actually believe that I lost a very lucrative gig because I had the audacity to tell a, a newbie what to do. I actually truly believe this. I actually truly believe this. I, I, I think that when people... Um, When you do the right thing today, you get punished for it. So I guess when I said I don't know why I feel the way I do, I think maybe it's because a whip dog doesn't do it again. Oh, uh, when you whip a dog, he won't he won't do whatever it is you whipped him for again. And that's how I feel like sometimes when it comes to doing the right thing, I I often feel like a whip dog. Because you get punished for doing the right thing. Anyway, I'll stop talking about that. <laughs> Javier says, I personally use a French horn mouthpiece on my trumpet almost all the time. Wow, that's interesting. I do that because when I change to a trumpet mouthpiece, everything is extremely easy. The sound is not the same, though. That's correct. And the intonation will be also very off. I strongly recommend, if you can get it, I know that um, I'm sure that Chile is a lot like South Africa. And in South Africa, you can't just like go to the store and buy a mouthpiece, right? Um, but this, this F1 and there are other mouthpieces like it would actually be a better choice for what you're doing. If you ever have a chance to buy something that is deep like that, so that's almost as deep as a French horn mouthpiece. So, but, but yes, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Gabriel says, now I understand when you wrote those lipsters. <laughs> now, yep. Cardo says, nowadays the rule is to be politically correct. That's right. And even that's not. Blah, blah, I'm not going to get started on that. Uh, I, I'm not going to get started on that. Oh, my. <sighs> There's something that happened this week. And, well, I'm not going to say it. Well, I better, well, no. You know what happens when I say, oh, I'm not going to say it, and then everyone thinks that they're, yes, that's, Javier says, uh, is that Shoki? Yes, it's a Shoki. Um, now, if I don't say it, then everyone's going to be thinking that that's, that I'm talking about them. I'm not talking, to, chances are not, okay? But um, let's just say it has to do with be being politically correct. And you know what? This is something I will say. In my, I had a great, a wonderful, I had a wonderful teacher for government. The class in high school was called government, where we learned about politics. We learned about the the. The branches of government, we learned about the bicameral legislature and all that stuff, right? And um, he said something that stuck with me all these years. He said, everybody is okay with a policy until it hurts their own pocketbook. And that sort of reminds me of one of my students told me a story and apparently this is a very 
commonly used adage, and I'm not I'm not being politically here, uh, political here. Um, this guy said, and I, it was my first time hearing it. This guy said, a liberal is a conservative who's never been robbed before, uh, never been mugged before. And, um, and yes, so, you know, all of the, all of this political correctness can sound very nice and friendly until it's happening to you, until they cancel you, until they censor you. You know, it seems like such a wonderful thing to fight for. But the thing is, is um, people will, the people when it comes to politics are extremely cannibalistic, <laughs> right? And they will chew you up in a heartbeat and they don't care how long you've been part of their team. They will chew you up and spit you out overnight. So, um, and when I say, when I say this week, I won't go into details, but um, no, I won't. I won't even say it. But it was a it was a political correct scenario that I won't go into. That, and I don't think it's funny. By the way, I don't think it's funny at all. I just think it's very ironic. So, and I know a lot of people think irony and funny are the same thing. Um, this is not funny. It's it's ironic. So, yeah. Sorry, guys. I I I, I have to watch my mouth. I will tell you this too, since we're on the subject. I've decided lately. You know, we live in a, a, a an internet society now. And one of the things that I've observed is that people today, and I don't think it's one side or the other. I don't think it's the liberals or the, the conservatives or the left or the right. I think everybody in our society has this tendency now. They have to say what's on their mind. And you know what? Going back thousands and thousands of years, that has always been considered not wise. That's always been considered foolish. The foolish people spout their mouths off, and the wise people keep their mouths shut. And I decided that because, you know, I have to shoot my mouth off because I'm a teacher. This is what I do. That's why we have a Q&A and not just me blabbing my mouth off on, you know. It's a Q&A. I'm here to answer your questions, and that's my objective here. And, and I'm, I'm going to admit that there are some times where I feel like shooting my mouth off about um, things that bother me and stuff like that. But I want to do a better job now because, because now I see it so clearly. What is Twitter? Twitter is just a bunch of people who can't control themselves. They've got no self-control. So I'm, I'm trying today to be wise. That doesn't mean that you don't say anything ever. I think it has to come down to timing. If, if the thought comes to your head and now you have to post it on Twitter, that's not a good thing. That's why people get in so much trouble. Javier says that F1 mouthpiece you showed is a flugelhorn one or a trumpet. It's a trumpet. It is shorter. Uh, the documentation for the mouthpiece says that they had to shorten the shank because it was flat. The mouthpiece played flat, naturally flat. So they had to shorten the shank to make it in tune. That's how deep it is. That's how deep that mouthpiece is. They had to shorten the shank. Uh, 
Javier says the intonation thing is right. With my French horn mouthpiece, I don't have move tuning slides. That's right. But even one note to the next, so your octaves will be either compressed or expanded, and that will make it uh, make all of your notes out of tune, even if you do get the slide in the right place. Javier says so because it changes the tune. That's right. So, any other questions? We've got five minutes. I'm going to go get my hair cut, believe it or not. Finally, it's been months. Um, it's my barber. I really like this barber. This is the first time I've had a nice barber. Um, my barber is only open on certain days, and it's hard for me to get in there. Javier says, can I find that mouthpiece on Shoki's website? Yes, you can. Cardo says, what are your thoughts on drinking coffee and trumpet playing? Well, <laughs> I'm a coffee yo-yo. Sometimes I drink coffee and then I get, get off of it. I've gone as much as a year and a half getting off of it. I'm about to stop again. I would like to never drink coffee ever again for the rest of my life, but I don't I don't have that much willpower. I, I, I wish I could just stop. Um, as far as what it does to your trumpet playing, you know, <laughs> I don't know how true this is either, but and I don't know who it was, but there's a trumpet player who always used to play his gigs drunk, but he always played very, very well. This is from jazz history, right? And someone asked him, hey, man, you always, you're always drunk when you're on these gigs, but you always play so well. How do you do that? And the guy, this is a trumpet legend, right? He says, oh, that's easy. I practice drunk. And, you know, I use that that story as a simile, as a metaphor for all of these kinds of things. If you want to play, if you want to uh, play trumpet while drinking coffee, then you should drink coffee when you practice so that when you're performing, you don't have problems when you're performing. But as far as the effects that it has, I'm not so concern about it what what it does to your trumpet playing as i am about what it does to your health um now i know that a lot of people think that the health part of it is negligible i i'm 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 aware of that um it's not negligible for some people um i won't go into my own personal health issues i have only minor health issues but i recently did some research on caffeine and discovered that part of my minor health issues is uh, what, what we would say irritated by the caffeine, okay? Part of my minor health issues is made a little bit worse by the caffeine. And it's not, it's not the obvious stuff. I know we all know about high blood pressure and caffeine. Um, I'm not talking about that. But there is a connection to something else that I'm working on, and I won't tell you guys what it is. Um, but there's a connection between the caffeine and that. And I'm going to try to stop. I'm currently, I'm currently doing only decaf right now, and... Um, I plan on when what I have in the in the pantry, when that's done, I will stop drinking coffee again. And by the way, the time I told you I went a year and a half without any coffee, it wasn't just coffee. Um, the there's chocolate has caffeine in it too. So I went a year and a half with no chocolate, um, nothing that had caffeine in it. 
no T, um, nothing. And, you know, now that I know this about this one health concern, I hope to never get back on again. That's where I'm at right now. But as far as directly connected to the trumpet, just make sure you're consistent, right? If, so, here, so it works both ways. You don't want to go and drink coffee for a performance if you're not drinking coffee bef when you're practicing and vice versa. You don't want to be drinking coffee all the time and then not when you're performing because that's going to be just as bad. So, so yeah. Gabriel says, can I play hymns on the cornet? I tried and they were nice. Yes, of course you can. You know, technically those hymns work for any B-flat instrument. The clarinet will work. Um, the only, okay, so I shouldn't say any B-flat instrument. Tenor sax can't because I've, uh, the, it goes too low for the tenor sax. But clarinet is fine. Raimo says, did you know in Finland we drink more coffee than any other country by a person? <laughs> 12 kilos. Wow. No, I didn't know that. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So, yeah, I don't have a problem with coffee. I, I'm, I was drinking it here now, right? It's just, um, you know... I'm right on the edge of having some, I said I have minor health issues. I'm trying to kick that in the butt now so I don't have major health issues down the road. So when I, when I learned what I did about the caffeine influencing that one thing, and if any of you want to know about that, what that is, I will answer a private email. I just won't put that stuff out here. Cardo says, I stopped taking caffeine for about three months, but I came back to it. Life was sad without it. I was feeling like depressed all the time. That's the addictive part of it, right? You know what happens to me? I just get so sleepy. And in fact, I told you when we very first started this Q&A, I told you guys that it's been an almost lazy day. It's because I only stopped doing full calf coffee two or three days ago, and I haven't adjusted yet. So I've been like yawning here. Gabriel says, in fact, my wife wants to try the hymns on the clarinet. See, there you go. Clarinet and flugelhorn would be beautiful. <laughs> Gabriel says you guys drink dark water not coffee <laughs> try Italian espresso when you say what <laughs> oh boy and Ramos clarifying that it's 12 kilos per year yeah I kind of I kind of assume that Oh, yeah. So I've had, uh, Gabriel, I've had some Italian uh, coffee. It was many years ago. I was in, so in Switzerland, in, in uh, Montreux, they've got, it's nice because you can, you can have German, you can have French, you can have Italian. Um, just by walking across the street. And yes, um, good stuff. All right, guys, it's always a pleasure hanging out with you. Um, as always, God bless you guys. Um, thanks for hanging out. And we'll see you next week. Good questions, always. I like you guys' questions. It, it, um, really keeps me on my toes too. One of these days we'll have cumbia day. 
Oh my. Javier says, have an Italian mother-in-law. I know what espresso is. It looks like petroleum. <laughs> Gabriel says, thanks, Eddie. Have a nice weekend. Yes, Raimo. Um, yes, all of you guys, thank you very much. Um, have a great week. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next time, okay? Bye.